So good good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the to the second day of the CB Research Annual Research Conference. Uh, we have two papers in this session, very interesting, both of them. The first one is from uh, uh, is by Luca Fornaro, uh, Pompeo Fabra and Center for Research in International Economics, um, and proposes uh, what I think is a very uh, interesting and novel channel of non-neutrality for monetary policy. This is what I I, I, I took away from uh, from your paper. Uh, very interesting, very relevant for the current times of monetary restrictions. So. I will invite um, Luca to the podium uh, for his uh, exposition. He uh, has, as you know, 30 minutes, followed by 15 minutes for uh, uh, Morten Raven, UCL. Good morning, Mort Morten, uh, the, uh, the discussant. And then uh, we'll open the, the floor for questions and answers, including in the um, live webcast, and I, I have a slide, so I invite you know, those who are connected from afar to place questions, and I'll try my best to dispatch the questions uh, afterwards. So, uh, Luca, over to you. Okay, so thanks a lot to the organizers for uh, inviting me to present this paper. It's a huge pleasure to be here. So this joint work with uh, Martin Wolf. Right, so technological progress often takes the form of automation. That is, we are constantly discovering new ways to replace uh, labor with capital or machine in uh, uh, performing some production task. Just to show you a little bit of data here, I'm plotting uh, uh, the evolution of robot density, the number of robots per worker in the EU and the US, just to show which is one measure of automation, just to show you that there's been a steady rise of uh, the use of robots over the last uh, 30 years. Right, uh, in this paper we want to think uh, about the implication of uh, this process for monetary policies. So we want to think about questions such as, uh, is automation deflationary? Uh, does uh, automation generate uh, technological unemployment, as Keynes argued uh, in 1930? Um, how does monetary policy affect the use of automation? Can a monetary tightening by increasing the cost of capital lead to less automation and less labor productivity? So we think that these are very interesting questions. These are actually questions that are present uh, in the policy debate, but perhaps surprisingly, there is not so much academic literature on this topic. And we think that one of the reasons is that we really don't have many frameworks connecting monetary policy of automation. So the main objective of uh, this paper is really to provide one. And uh, what we do in the end is quite simple. So we start from uh, a standard model of automation, the one proposed in a seminal paper by Achemoglu and Restrepo. And the key aspect of their model is just that they look at an economy in which uh, capital and labor are uh, very substitutable in performing some production task. So firms have some flexibility about whether to perform some task using machines or uh, human workers. And this is interesting because this means that we can think about how macroeconomic condition, uh, such as aggregate demand or the cost of capital or wages, affect firms' use of automation technologies, how intensively firms use uh, uh, capital and labor in production. And we uh, add two simple features to this framework to think about monetary policy. So first of all, we add nominal wage rigidities so that uh, monetary policy can have real effects and uh, uh, employment might deviate from uh, its natural level. And second, uh, we think about a case in which uh, households have a discounted Euler equation. So essentially, there is a long run IS curve, a steady state uh, relationship between uh, uh, aggregate demand and the interest rate. And we do so because some research has shown that this uh, uh, addition uh, fixes some anomalies of the new Keynesian model and because it allows us to think about long lasting liquidity traps, which is something that uh, we definitely want to do. Just to give you a, a preview of the result, I will show you two sets of results. First, I will show you how monetary policy affects firms' use of automation, the automation effect of uh, monetary policy. So, uh, you know, in the traditional view, the one uh, uh, captured by the new Keynesian model, monetary policy mainly affects the labor market, so employment and uh, inflation. Uh, this is going to be the case in our model too, but I will show you that in our framework, under certain circumstances, monetary policy may also affect firms' use of automation and labor productivity. Uh, and what is going to be interesting also is that this effect is going to operate at a different horizon than the traditional one. So we see that in our economy, monetary policy has some transitory effect on employment and inflation, while it tends to have a more persistent effect on uh, firms' technological choices and labor productivity. 
And then I will show you that uh, uh, in our uh, model, a trade-off between uh, unemployment and automation may arise for the central bank. It is under certain circumstances, the central bank may need to choose whether to support employment or to support firms' use of automation technologies and uh, uh, labor productivity. And this is going to be the case during period of persistently weak demand, so during long-lasting liquidity traps, or during periods in which uh, uh, there is rapid technological progress skewed toward uh, automation technologies. All right, so since I don't have much time, uh, I will show you just a sketch of the model. So I will show you how the model behaves in steady state because that's a simple way to uh, give you the gist of uh, the framework, but bear in mind that in the background there is a fully microfounded dynamic model that you can find in, uh, in the paper. So the household side of the economy is very simple. So first, uh, household need to decide how much to consume. And uh, here, consumption is just uh, a decreasing function of the real interest rate for the usual reason, right? If the interest rate is higher, households want to say more, and they will consume less. Second, households need to decide how to allocate their saving between bonds and capital. At the margin, they need to be indifferent, meaning that uh, the real interest rate uh, has to be uh, equal to, to firm's cost of capital. And this is going to play a role later on because monetary policy, by affecting the real interest rate, will also affect the cost of capital and so the incentives that firms have to use capital in production. And finally, households just supply some uh, uh, exogenous amount of labor at bar, which is just fixed for simplicity. So if wages were flexible, uh, employment would always be equal to household labor supply, would always be equal to a bar, so we will always be at full employment. But uh, uh, as I will show you later on, in this economy, there will be some uh, Wage rigidities, meaning that we can think of cases in which actual employment is lower than household labor supply, so there is involuntary unemployment, or the opposite case in which uh, employment is bigger than a bar, so there is essentially overheating on uh, the labor market. The production side is where things get uh, a little bit more interesting. Here we are really following uh, Achemoglu and Restrepo, so um, there is a final good which is produced using uh, a continuum of intermediate inputs or production tasks. Um, some of these tasks, those with index lower than JL, can be uh, produced using capital only. So these are the production tasks for which capital is really essential. Think about the building, for instance. Then there are some production tasks, those with index between uh, JL and JH, for which uh, labor and capital are highly substitutable. So they're actually perfect substitute. So here we are thinking about those uh, production tasks for which firms have a choice whether to automate them, perform them using machine, or perform them using uh, human. Think about, for instance, cashier in a supermarket, right? Uh, a supermarket can employ automatic cashiers, or it can employ people to work as cashiers, and it will choose you know, which is the best option. And finally, there is a set of tasks, those with index higher than JH, uh, for which simply an automation technology is not being invented yet. So this task has to be performed with labor. So you can think about this parameter JH, really some technological constraint uh, on uh, how much firms can automate the production process, and we will take this uh, as given uh, throughout uh, uh, the paper. Okay, one nice thing about this framework is that once you aggregate the production function, it, it looks very familiar. It looks like just a Cobb Douglas in capital and labor with a twist. What is the twist? Well, the intensity with which capital enters the production function, so J star, it depends on, it's endogenous, and it depends on firm's decision. So the more firms want to automate the production process, the higher J star will be. How do firms take their decision? Well, very simply, they compare the cost of capital to the wage adjusted for productivity, and they pick the cheapest option. So for instance, if uh, uh, the cost of capital is high compared to the wage, firms will try to use uh, labor as much as possible in production. So we will be in a low automation economy in which J star is equal to JH. If the cost of capital is equal to the wage, firms will be indifferent at the margin. So we'll be in an intermediate automation economy in which J star can be anywhere between JL and JH. Finally, if uh, uh, capital is cheap compared to labor, firms will try to exploit as much as possible uh, automation possibilities. So we will be in a high automation economy in which J star is equal to JH. So this model captures in a simple way the intuitive, I would say, notion that uh, uh, cheaper capital compared to labor induces firms to use uh, automation technologies more intensively in production. And it also captures the idea, which I find relevant and interesting, that this effect might be nonlinear. They might operate sometimes, but sometimes they might not operate. For instance, when you reach the automation frontier, when J star is equal to JH, further drops in the cost of capital will not affect uh, uh, firms' use of automation anymore. <laughs> 
Nominal rigidities, here we do things in a very simple way. We just assume that uh, there is a wage Phillips curve, so that nominal wage inflation uh, is positively related to the deviation of employment from its natural level. Prices uh, inherit part of the wage stickiness, right? Uh, this means that, as usual, by controlling the nominal interest rate, the central bank can effectively control the real interest rate in this economy. And from now on, just to make things simple, I will frame uh, monetary policy directly in terms of a path for this real interest rate. And then, as usual, you know, uh, changes in the real interest rate affects aggregate demand, so the sum of consumption and investment. So, for instance, when the central bank lowers the interest rate, households want to consume more, firms want to invest more, there is more aggregate demand and uh, higher output. All right, so now let me describe how uh, monetary policy relates to firms' use of automation. So recall that here um, the interest rate uh, is related to the cost of capital because of the no arbitrage condition between the two assets. And also recall that here firms, whenever they need to decide whether to use an automation technology or not, uh, they look at the relative price of capital compared to wages. And it turns out that once you solve the model, things get very simple and stuck. So there is uh, just a treasure value for the interest rate, let me call R bar, such that uh, if uh, the interest rate is higher than R bar, then capital is expensive and firms use the low automation technology. If the interest rate is lower than R bar, then capital is cheap and firms use uh, the high automation uh, technology. This means that uh, um, you know, if the interest rate drops from above to below R bar, then firms will react to that by changing their production technology, by increasing the intensity with which they use uh, automation in production. And when this happens, you will have a boom in investment because in order to exploit uh, this high automation technology, firms need to accumulate capital, they need to produce machines, uh, but also an increase in labor productivity because uh, a higher use of automation uh, technologies in this economy increases the productivity of, uh, uh, of workers. And this automation effect on productivity is really a distinguishing feature of our framework compared to the standard New Keynesian model, and it's going to play an important role for what comes next. So let me just show you how this works uh, graphically. Here I have you know, the interest rate on the vertical axis and labor productivity on the horizontal one. And what's interesting from this graph is that you can see that around our bar, there is a jump in productivity. So when the interest rate drops from above to below our bar, firms change their use of automation technology, and this gives a boost to labor productivity. Now, things in this framework are very stark and unrealistic. Of course, there is no such threshold in reality. But even if you, you know, adopted a more realistic view, a more realistic and smoother relationship between the interest rate and firms' use of automation technology, as we do in the appendix, the main message will remain. So the main message is that uh, over certain range of the interest rate, uh, changes in the interest rate are going to affect uh, firms' use of automation, and labor productivity is going to react particularly strongly compared to uh, what we normally think. All right, so now let me uh, connect this to the labor market. Uh, how is employment affected by changes in the interest rate? So here, equilibrium employment is given by firms' labor demand, which is the product of uh, uh, how much firms need to produce, which is determined by aggregate demand, times the inverse of labor productivity. And you can see here that there are really two effects going on. So uh, for instance, suppose that there is a drop in the interest rate, perhaps induced by monetary policy. So on the one hand, this is going to increase uh, aggregate demand. Uh, in order to satisfy this higher aggregate demand, firms are going to need to employ more workers. And so through this aggregate demand channel, a lower interest rate increases employment. And this is the usual channel that we have in mind when we think about the impact of monetary policy on the labor market. But here there might be a second effect sometimes operating, the automation effect, which is just that if the interest rate, if a drop in the interest rate triggered an increase in J-star, an increase in the use of automation by firms, this is going to trigger a large in increase in labor productivity, which is going to reduce firms' labor demand because a higher labor productivity means that in order to satisfy a given level of demand, firms need to employ less workers. Which effect dominates? Well, it depends. So here, you know, I'm showing graphically how firms' labor demand relates to uh, the interest rate. For instance, let's start thinking about what happens above our star. So here, firms are using the low automation technology. If uh, the interest rate drops a little bit, labor demand is going to increase. Why? Well, because here the aggregate demand effect dominates. You know, as usual, when the aggregate demand effect is the main one, a lower interest rate increases demand for employment. But you see that once you get close to this threshold R bar, labor demand becomes no monotonic. Why? Because when uh, the interest rate drops below R bar, firms switch their production technique to the high automation, high capital intensive one. This increases labor productivity, 
and this provides a drag on, on labor demand. So here, the first interesting thing about this framework is that contrary to what would happen in the new Keynesian model, uh, labor demand and the interest rate uh, have a non-monotonic relationship. Over a certain range, perhaps surprisingly, a drop in the interest rate might decrease equilibrium employment. What are the implications for monetary policy? So let me start by thinking about a simple case in which uh, uh, monetary policy seeks to stabilize the economy around full employment, around the level of employment equal to all bar which is also the level of uh, employment consistent with uh, zero inflation, with inflation being equal to, to target. So here, this monetary policy stance is captured by this red vertical line. Uh, a steady state of the model is given by the intersection of uh, this line and uh, firm's labor demand. And as I draw it here, there is a single intersection, so a single steady state, which is associated with a particular value of uh, the interest rate. Now, this is a possibility, but it's not the only one. So you might also have cases in which the two curves intersect more than once. So in which there are multiple steady states consistent with the economy being at full employment and inflation being equal to target. So for instance, here I have three of them. So let's forget for a second about the intermediate one, which is unstable, but let's think about the two extreme. So uh, the upward steady state is one in which the interest rate is high. So one in which aggregate demand is weak. Why is the economy operating at full employment in spite of weak aggregate demand? Well, because the high interest rate induces firms to rely more on labor than capital in production, and this sustains firms' labor demand. So this low use of automation technologies is what reconciles full employment with um, a weak aggregate demand. The steady state down there, instead, is associated with strong aggregate demand because the interest rate is lower. How can this be consistent with an equilibrium? Well, the low interest rate also induces firms to use more intensively machines in production. This boosts labor productivity, and it allows firms to satisfy a higher level of demand with the same level of employment compared to the other steady state. So here the lesson is really that there are you know, multiple strategies through which a given inflation target and a given level of employment may be achieved. Uh, it may be achieved through a combination of weak demand, weak automation, and weak labor productivity or through a combination of uh, uh, strong demand, uh, strong use of automation by firms, strong labor productivity. So also consider that you know, the steady states are associated with different value of the interest rate. This means that in our framework, there is no single value of the natural interest rate in the long run. There are multiple ones, because each steady state is associated with a different value of the natural interest rate, which are associated with different uses of technologies and different uh, uh, labor productivity. OK, so now let me show you a little bit uh, the dynamics of the model. Let's start from a classic experiment. Let's say that there is uh, a temporary monetary tightening, so that the central bank engineers a temporary increase in the real interest rate, but then the real interest rate gradually goes back to its initial value over time. Now, there are many lines in this graph, so perhaps you cannot see. Let me just explain in words. So in the short run, this uh, monetary hike uh, is perfectly conventional effect. So the higher interest rate, the price is aggregate demand. So this generates a recession, output drops. Uh, in the short run, capital is predetermined. So uh, the drop in demand is accommodated by a drop in employment. So firms start firing workers because that's the only margin of adjustment that they have in the short run. Uh, as unemployment increases, wage inflation drops, and inflation drops as well. So in the short run, the response of the economy is perfectly conventional. What happens uh, in the medium run, however, is a little bit more new and more interesting. Why? Because, well, the high cost of capital induces firms to decumulate their capital stock, to disinvest, and moreover, it induces them to switch from uh, the high to the low automation technology, to de-automate their production process. And as you can see, you know, this generates, uh, over the medium run, a drop in labor productivity. Um, and you can see this also by the fact that uh, the recovery in employment you know, is much faster than the recovery in output. Why? Well, because this medium run drop in productivity means that uh, in order to satisfy the initial level of demand, now firms have to employ more workers. So here, this monetary policy action has a transitory impact on employment, but a persistent impact on firms' use of technology and labor productivity. What about inflation? You see that inflation has a funky behavior, no? because inflation drops in the short run, which is what we would expect, but then it rises. Why does it rise? Well, because of two reasons. On the one hand, lower labor productivity increases firms' costs and pushes firms to increase their prices. And second, since we have this very swift recovery in the labor market, 
sustains wage inflation and it's another source of uh, inflationary pressures. So you can see that uh, uh, the response of inflation to a conventional tightening might be mon non monotonic over time. Let me show you another experiment, perhaps a, a more novel one. Let's think about a case in which monetary policy brings the economy from the high automation steady state to the low automation one. How can this happen? Well, through a gradual increase in the real interest rate, a gradual monetary tightening. Once again, uh, in the short run, the response of the economy is perfectly conventional. So the higher interest rate reduces aggregate demand and we have a recession. Again, the capital stock is predetermined, so this initial recession is associated with a very big increase in unemployment and a very large drop in inflation. But over the medium run, once again, firms react to the higher cost of capital by decumulating their capital stock and by deautomating their production process. So this increase in the interest rate generates over the medium run a drop in labor productivity. And actually in this case, since we are moving from one steady state to the other, this process of deautomation becomes self-sustaining in the sense that even if uh, employment and inflation go back to their initial value, we have a permanent impact on uh, labor productivity and a permanent impact on output. So you can see from this example, even perhaps more starkly, that uh, in this model, monetary policy action might have a transitory impact on employment and inflation, but a very persistent one on uh, firms' use of automation, labor productivity, and, and output. All right, so now let me show you the second set of results, which is about uh, the possibility of a trade-off between uh, uh, sustaining automation or employment for the central bank. Let me go back to uh, the steady state graph, uh, and let me just modify it a little bit by assuming that uh, the central bank might be constrained by a lower bound on the interest rate. So here, as before, the central bank would like to stabilize the economy around full employment, but it might not be able to because of the existence of a lower bound on the interest rate, which is captured graphically by the horizontal portion of uh, the monetary policy curve. So as I draw it here, uh, this lower bound is not a problem since the three steady states are consistent with an interest rate above it. So the central bank can just pick which steady state it prefers. Now let's think about a case in which we have a persistent drop in aggregate demand. So a persistent drop in aggregate demand moves down labor demand by firms because for any level of the interest rate, now aggregate demand is weaker, so firms' labor demand is weaker. And as you can see here, uh, the full employment, high automation steady state becomes unattainable. Why? Because in order to get there, the central bank will need to set an interest rate lower than the lower bound, but that's not possible. So now the central bank is facing uh, really a choice. It can either stabilize uh, the economy on the lower steady state, one which is in which the interest rate is low, so the use of automation technologies is high, but in which aggregate demand is too weak to maintain uh, full employment. So there is some involuntary unemployment. Or it can stabilize the economy up there, you know, the steady state in which uh, uh, the economy operates at full employment, but it does so because firms use the low automation technology, and so uh, labor productivity is low, and this is what is maintaining the economy at full employment. So this is telling you that during times of weak demand, the central bank may face a choice between uh, sustaining employment or firms use of automation and labor productivity. And another way to see this result is that we typically associate period of weak demand with uh, unemployment and deflation, right? With liquidity traps in which unemployment is high and inflation is lower than target. What this model is telling you is that this is a possibility, but not the only one. No? Because in this framework, a period of weak demand might also show up into low labor productivity, low investment, low use of available automation technology without having much of an impact on employment and inflation. So employment and inflation are not necessarily a good indicator of whether aggregate demand is strong or weak in, in this economy. And this might look like a theoretical curiosity, but actually there are some commentators which have argued that uh, this might explain part of the experience of the UK after the financial crisis. Now, in the UK, employment recovered pretty quickly from the financial crisis, but investment and labor productivity did not. And there are some commentators that argue that what happened is that firms uh, started to rely less on capital and more on labor in production. So weak aggregate demand show up into weak investment uh, and uh, uh, weak uh, productivity growth. All right, let me show you the last uh, uh, result uh, of the paper, which is about uh, what happens if there is a rise in automation. So what happens if we make some discoveries that allows firms to automate more the production process? Here, this is simply captured through an exogenous increase in this index JH, in the number of tasks that firms potentially can automate. 
Now, the interesting case is the one uh, which I'm showing you in this graph. So uh, when there is an increase in this automation frontier, uh, if firms are using the high automation technologies, they will need less labor to satisfy a given level of aggregate demand. So that's why firms' labor demand curve shifts toward the left for uh, value of the interest rate associated with the high automation technology. And from this graph, you can see really two things. The first one is that in order to maintain full employment, uh, the central bank may need to react to this kind of technological progress by lowering the interest rate, by sustaining aggregate demand. Because now that our production possibility frontier is increased, we need more demand to keep uh, the same amount of workers employed. And the second result is that this type of technological progress uh, might generate a liquidity trap, a case in which the central bank ends up being constrained by the lower bound. And it might generate some technological unemployment, which is something that Keynes uh, thought about uh, many, many years ago. Why? Because you know, uh, now that firms can rely more on machines compared to workers to produce, if the central bank or if fiscal policy do not sustain aggregate demand, they will just fire workers. They will replace workers with machines. And so there will be some technological unemployment. And you see that, once again, here we have a trade-off between sustaining automation and employment, because here, in order to maintain the economy at full employment, the central bank will need to hike the interest rate to induce a de-automation of the production process, so as to induce firms to employ uh, more workers. OK, so uh, this is pretty much uh, what I said. Uh, let me wrap up. So the main message of the paper is really that uh, you know, monetary policy, besides affecting traditional variables such as uh, employment and inflation, can also have impact on non-traditional ones. It can be non-neutral with respect to firms' technological choices and labor productivity. And one interesting aspect is that uh, uh, you know, the traditional effect and the non-traditional one may operate at different time horizons. So in the short run, uh, the economy might react to changes in monetary policy in a very conventional way, mainly through the employment and inflation margin. But over the medium run, the automation effect might kick in, and so we might see a response in uh, firms' use of technologies and, and labor productivity. And this might you know, generate uh, interesting behavior. For instance, it might generate uh, a non-monotonic response of inflation to uh, a monetary tightening. The second message of the paper is really that uh, um, you know, weak aggregate demand, rather than showing up into high unemployment and low inflation, might show up into low investment and low labor productivity. So you know, perhaps if we want to uh, understand whether demand is high enough, you know, we might look at other indicators uh, compared to the standard labor market and prices one. And uh, moreover, this means that spell of weak aggregate demand, like in the secular stagnation type of uh, literature, might pose the central bank in front of the dilemma, whether to sustain employment or to sustain automation and, and labor productivity. And the final message is really that uh, periods in which uh, technological progress skewed toward automation is very fast, which some authors have suggested that is the case uh, nowadays, may uh, call for expansionary policies. Otherwise, this might generate uh, uh, technological unemployment, or it might again push uh, the central bank in front of this trade-off between sustaining employment or uh, the use of uh, automation technology. OK, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so thanks a lot to, for inviting me to discuss this paper. I tried to, I, I did try to convince my avatar to do the discussion, but uh, the avatar refused. So no, no robots there. Um, so the big picture here. Um, I sort of think of the, um, thinking about two, uh, two trends we've seen in, in the economy over the last uh, few decades. So here I've shown the, in blue the, the labor share in the United States and in orange is the, uh, the long-run real interest rate. And um, we see if you look from the early 1980s onwards, we see this uh, marked drop in, in, the, in the labor share that's been uh, discussed a lot. And we see this um, uh, ever-dropping uh, long-run real interest rate. So, um, so think about those trends. Uh, so they, of course, have been discussed a lot. So um, what are the factors that uh, lie behind the drop in, in the labor share? 
Uh, one could be uh, what uh, Jean talked about yesterday, regulation, so uh, uh, increasing markups because of market power. Um, uh, another one uh, may be uh, uh, labor unions losing power, uh, so therefore um, 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 an increase uh, uh, or decrease in labor share from that. Or it could be automation, which is sort of uh, what we uh, think about in, in this paper here. Yeah. What about the, the declining real interest rate? Uh, well, again, we know a lot of explanations, possible explanations of that uh, demographics, um, low productivity growth, um, uh, maybe increase in idiosyncratic risk or the Chinese savings slot. Um, so, th so those things have been discussed a lot. Um, and the question is, wh where does monetary policy come in in respect to these uh, long-run trends? And I think the standard answer is that it really doesn't. Uh, because the standard view would be that um, the monetary policy might impact on the labor share, but it will sort of be a temporary impact and it would happen through markups. Um, um, and what about the long run real interest rate? Well, again, we think monetary policy is sort of manipulating uh, the short or medium run real interest rate is not uh, the determining factor of the long run real interest rate. So, um, so sort of think of those as uh, things that are divorced uh, uh, from monetary policy. This paper here um, um, uh, comes up uh, with a theory that sort of uh, goes against this. Yeah. And um, the theory is one in which uh, monetary policy may have uh, medium or, lo or long-term effects on productivity uh, and on real interest rates. And the key challenge of this here is, first of all, uh, effects of monetary policy on productivity through uh, automation choices, and second of all, a, neck, uh, a relationship between wealth and real interest rates. Um, uh, in, in the model here. And then the two are put together. And what uh, Luca shows in the paper, uh, together with Martin, is that uh, when you do this, um, you can get these unconventional effects of monetary policy on productivity, employment, and inflation. Um, you, um, they also show that uh, you might use a fiscal policy to improve productivity without inflationary cost. And um, you get this possibility, um, which some central banks might uh, like, um, that it might, might be good to run the economy hot if you want to es escape an um, um, uh, equilibrium by your low employment uh, uh, productivity and low productivity. <clears throat> okay, so how does this uh, come about? So there are basically three things going on in the model. So the first one is an endogenous uh, technology choice. So here, think about sectors around the, the horizontal axis. And then um, uh, on the vertical axis, I'm plotting um, uh, the, the productivity of uh, capital and labor. Uh, there's a subset of factors for which um, uh, you can use capital uh, up to some J8, and then a subset of factors for which you can use uh, 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 labor. Um, and where they, in, uh, where they overlap these, uh, there is a choice for firms whether to use uh, capital or, 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 or labor. <clears throat> And uh, the choice of that will obviously be determined by what is the most cost effective, so uh, the ratio of the uh, real wage to the cost of capital relative to the uh, productivity. Yeah. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second of all, is, uh, uh, is a case in which um, uh, wealth enters into utility functions. So, um, so we're used to working with models where we, got the, where we have the utility of real cash balances. Uh, here, uh, there's a utility of uh, holding real wealth. And because of that, uh, when you work out the, the oil equation, uh, the oil equation now also uh, depends on the level of future consumption, so therefore on wealth. Um, so this, well, this will generate a, 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 a long-run um, trade-off between uh, consumption and the real interest rate. And then thirdly, uh, sticky nominal wages. Uh, wages are just um, uh, partially to changes in employment. <clears throat> and because of that, monetary policy um, uh, has real effects. Okay, so what you get then is you get this sort of labor demand uh, diagram here. There's a downward and slip uh, or part of it, uh, standard part, and then uh, there's a horizontal part, uh, and that's where you uh, sort of uh, uh, start adopting these robots here. Yeah. Okay, so this is non-monotonic uh, uh, because of the automation choice. And now, if you allow the central bank uh, to sort of set, uh, set the policy so as to target full employment, you get this possibility 
uh, that you might end up in a high automation equilibrium with a low cost of capital or in a low automation equilibrium with a high cost of capital. And the two differ in, the low, in, in the productivity and therefore in uh, uh, you, the, the, the high automation uh, equilibrium is better one, you have higher welfare. That's sort of the static picture. <clears throat> um, but you put that together now with this IS curve, and then you can show that um, dynamically uh, you may also have the free equilibria. And uh, these two um, uh, extreme equilibria, they, they, are, they are both stable, uh, saddle power stable equilibria. So, so therefore, even if monetary policy aims at full employment, uh, you may end up in, uh, in a good or bad equilibrium. And um, large shocks here, they may uh, shift the economy uh, between these equilibria. Um, but it's important that this happens only because we have wealth in, in the utility function. If it didn't have that, then it would be a single equilibrium uh, and it would be stable. But um, with, the, with the sloping, uh, long run uh, sloping uh, IS curve, uh, we get this um, uh, possibility of multiple equilibria. <clears throat> And here, uh, what, what they showed is that if you have a, a temporary but very large tightening in a monetary policy, you may, uh, what you're going to get is you're going to get uh, uh, where you shift basically from, one, from, the, from uh, the good equilibrium to the bad equilibrium uh, in, over this uh, path of the real interest rate. Uh, there, uh, you may get this uh, pro persistent productivity slump, and you get this uh, inflation reversal so that the monetary tightening uh, becomes inflationary. We wouldn't hope that's the case right now. But, yeah, let's hope so. Um, and uh, in the same case, uh, when we have the multiple equilibria, if we have a permanent rise in the real interest rate, then uh, we can go from the good to the bad equilibrium permanently. So that's sort of what we get here. And on the reverse of this, that of course means that uh, you might want to uh, run the economy hot to escape a bad equilibrium. So allow some inflation and you end up in a good equilibrium in which you have low cost of capital and high automation. So that, I think, is what is going on here. <clears throat> so uh, comments. First, uh, okay, I think it's a great paper. It's full of ideas. And the model is very simple, but you get a lot out of it. It's also provocative. You get these uh, unconventional impact of monetary policy. Uh, you might want to uh, run the economy hot. You can use fiscal policy. Uh, stimulate the economy like crazy, don't get any inflation, uh, but you get high productivity. You can restore high productivity. And then uh, you might want to think about the um, uh, design monetary policy to account for automation as well. It's also actually, although it's preliminary, it's an extremely well-written well uh, paper, uh, so a uh, lot of respect there. Come, uh, these are more questions than comments. Uh, okay, um, so the first uh, one is that so in the case um, uh, uh, where we have a unique equilibrium, at least, uh, there I think uh, automation is more about distribution than productivity. So here I've, I've taken the case that they had before, but instead of having this like extreme uh, um, uh, uh, jump from uh, low to high automation, it sort of happens gradually. So as, I, uh, as um, we go across sectors here, these relative productivity differences change. And here, if we have an increase in automation because of an increase in capital productivity, what we get is that the productivity effects are really marginal because wh when you automate, the, 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 the um, productivity differences are very, very small. So it doesn't do so much about productivity automation here in this case, but it does do a lot about um, distribution. The, the labor share does change a lot. So I think maybe, I would, I would sort of think that would be nice maybe to sort of uh, refocus the, little, the paper a little bit towards distributional issues rather than productivity, because that I think is the general case uh, of automation. Secondly, <clears throat> um, one might uh, question how sensitive are technology choices to monetary policy or the frequencies that monetary policies can uh, affect real interest rate. Um, we would think that for many of these technologies, there might be significant uh, fixed cost of adopting a new technology. It's not capital deepening. It's not doing more of the same and doing something new. And that probably does take some uh, fixed cost uh, uh, to do that. <clears throat> 
So therefore, uh, what we should look at are longer term real rates, and here I just stole out of uh, Peter's uh, paper with Mark Gertler. Uh, what happens with the longer term real interest rate when we have a monetary policy shock? Two year rate moves not so differently from the short term rate, but if you look at the five year, 10 year rate, uh, then there doesn't seem to be so much action here, and we think that they probably are more important for long term decisions like automation. But um, but it, it would, so it would sort of be interesting to see uh, whether we do get uh, any empirical evidence that monetary policy impact on automation. We know on TFP there are papers around on that, but uh, do we have direct evidence on monetary policy on automation? Uh, thirdly, um, we, the uh, key thing in the paper to get the multiple equilibria is that we have this downward sloping uh, uh, Euler equation or, or, or IS curve. If you think about that in the cross section, so here I thought about, uh, so just write down that in the cross section. Uh, what this implies in cross section is that higher wealth households have uh, higher savings. And if you look at that, so here I just uh, taken a plot out of the paper by Fagering, Blumhoff, Holm, uh, Moll, and Natwick. If you look in red, that's the growth savings rate uh, uh, um, plotted against the wealth, and that's true, that's upward sloping. But if you, if you take out uh, uh, capital gains, then it's totally flat. So it's true that higher wealth households, they save more, but it's because of uh, capital gains. It's not, uh, uh, that's entirely where it comes from. And that's not really what's going on here. Uh, so, um, so maybe um, one, one might think that the, the, the oil equation might be negatively sloped in the, in the short run, but I wouldn't have thought in the long run. Um, unless we introduce other features. In that case, we'd have a unique equilibrium. In that case, monetary policy couldn't do this stuff in the long run. There will still be stuff in the short run, though. That's still interesting, I think. Uh, what about the fourth thing you get here is that, um, uh, so the paper shows that um, when there's a lower bound on the real interest rate, not, it's not a zero lower bound on nominal rate, but on the real rate, then you may get that um, a savings slot that can uh, mean that there's a policy, policy choice between automation or unemployment. And uh, you might get that increased automation can generate a liquidity trap with unemployment. And we know, so, um, so uh, in those cases, what you can do is you can use fiscal policy to restore the desired equilibrium. You do a big fiscal expansion, basically, to drag you uh, out of this bad equilibrium here. Yeah. This we know from standard uh, new Keynesian models, this happens even without automation. Um, when we're at the zero lower bound, we can get large uh, fiscal multipliers. And uh, large fiscal uh, interventions, they can root out like, liquidity traps, to, um, like in the paper of uh, Ben Habib, Hanka Boya Evans, or uh, in uh, Michaud's uh, 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 work. Um, but I think here, the, the thing is that once you put this actually into calibrated models, um, Although it's true you can do that, those fiscal interventions, they need to be very large. It's like taking f fiscal spending up to 60% of GDP, um, which we haven't seen, and probably we don't want to see, uh, see that tested in practice. So, I, yeah. So it's true you sort of get this, but whether actually you can do this with fiscal policy, I think maybe a little bit, yeah, we could question that. Okay. Final comments, I think um, uh, this is exciting research, uh, um, tying together structural issues and monetary policy. I would question though, I mean, we do give you guys here at the ECB and other central banks a lot of jobs, um, anchor inflation, okay, give us also full employment, give us financial stability, handle the green transition, think about inequality, and now, okay, do automation too. Uh, so. So another job uh, on your list there. So I would have sort of thought if you can do what is in the first bullet, um, quite happy. Um, <laughs> what can central banks do about technology choice? It would, I think it would be interesting to look at what the data says on this here. Finally, uh, are there better instruments maybe for structural issues here? So if, um, if we have low automation, may it be that we should think about education or infrastructure rather than monetary policy? Or um, is fast adoption is an issue, uh, maybe promote um, uh, reskilling and uh, things like that uh, rather than monetary policy. Okay, uh, let, me, let me stop that. But um, nice paper, yeah. <clears throat>
thanks a lot. Um, Luca, you may want to answer these four questions and comments. Yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for the discussion. It's really excellent, and uh, you give us uh, a lot of food for thought, and I agree with all your comments, I would say. Just a, a couple of reactions. Um, let's start from, from the end. So here, you know, one of the messages of the paper is that uh, even if the central bank just cares about uh, inflation and employment, you know, automation might play a role because it might affect our changes in monetary policy mediate into these other two variables. So perhaps even if uh, labor productivity or automation may not be per se a useful target for monetary policy, understanding this effect might, might be important you know, to understand how changes in uh, the interest rate, in the policy rate, may affect the labor market or, or inflation. Um, another thing that I uh, wanted to mention is that, uh, which actually thanks for give me a chance to talk about this, is that uh, you mentioned the, the empirical evidence, and that's very important because we see, you know, this paper is really as providing a framework to invite more empirical research. And one uh, thing that this framework is telling you is that uh, the type of empirical evidence that we have on monetary policy shock might not be useful to dig out uh, these effects because these effects only show up at certain moments. No, they only show up uh, uh, if uh, monetary changes are large and persistent, uh, or if uh, the economy is not already exploiting all the automation possibility given by our technological knowledge. And it also tells you that there might be some trace of the fact. No? As you mentioned, that uh, the decision whether to invest in automation or not may be subject to, to fixed costs. So we may see a lot of inaction for some value of the interest rate. And then once the interest rate crosses a threshold, we may get some big action, which is a bit what this model is capturing. So we think that this framework is useful to, you know, to try to, to dig out uh, how to measure in the data whether these effects are there or not. And then the last comment, um, I'm also glad that you emphasize you know, this reverse result because I talk about monetary tightening, but this model tells you that the opposite is also true, that monetary expansion overheating, that uh, a fiscal expansion might in the medium to long run increase uh, uh, labor productivity and, and perhaps output. Uh, though also what the model is telling you is that this doesn't come for free. You know, because in the short run, the economy is very conventional. So if you have a fiscal expansion, in the short run, this is going to be inflationary. So um, this might generate uh, in the medium run an increase in, uh, in use of automation technologies or labor productivity, but we need you know, to wait the short run inflationary costs against the potential long run uh, benefit. Likewise, you know, the same applies to running the economy hot. Here, yeah, monetary policy may increase productivity in the medium run by uh, overheating the economy for a while, but this is going to come at the cost of uh, uh, high inflation in the short run. And then, yeah, definitely we need to do more work to understand, you know, what determines this trade off, whether this depends on the state of the economy or some structural features of the economy. Again, we think that uh, the framework is useful to think about this kind of uh, trade off. But, uh, Thanks a lot. It was an excellent discussion. Wow. I see already a number of questions. Please. Um, Alex Pop of ECB. <clears throat> so uh, when we think, think of automation, indeed, we imagine you know robots displacing people most of the time. So. Uh, I guess in the construction business, you can dig a hole in the ground using 10 workers with spades, or you can use one worker with an excavator. So in that world, robots and workers are really um, substitutes. But uh, there can be labor augmenting uh, automation. For example, a very skilled surgeon using a very sophisticated robot to perform a very difficult operation. Uh, and, and even when automation is labor displacing, it can create new tasks where workers have a, or labor has a comparative advantage. This is something that Achimoglu and Ristrepo call a labor reinstating effect in a recent paper. So I was wondering if you bring into your model these uh, other properties of automation, would your insights change dramatically? Thank you. Do you, do you want to answer that? Yeah, that would be, well, one thing is that here, you know, I mentioned robots because they are the catchy way to think about automation. In reality, the biggest automation technology is ICT. It's computer software, that's really where the action uh, is. And uh, you know, you're right. You know, there might be some technological discoveries that are complement to labor. Here we want to think about uh, types of technological discoveries that substitute uh, labor. And, and as you said, you know, in uh, Chimoglu and Restrepo, there is this counterbalancing force that we invent new tasks that labor can perform, which counterbalance uh, the, um, 
new automation discoveries. Uh, here, the last part of the paper was really thinking about uh, a period in which uh, technology is skewed toward, uh, toward automation, which I think is what has happened over the last 20, 30 years. But this doesn't mean that this is going to be the case in the future, too. And, and it would be interesting to, to, to use the framework to think about different types of uh, technological progress. Francesco, yeah. So, um, I have a question. I think one point that Martin raised about the different frequencies at which this phenomenon operate, that seems very important to me. <coughs> and it seems to me that the model, the way it's written, is really not prepared to handle this because, for instance, the linearity in this intermediate region makes the two technologies perfectly substitutable. And that's what gives you the jump below and above and below our bar, right? So say that you make this substitutability kind of imperfect, then you would have an area of continuity. If you add fixed costs, you would have even more continuity. So we understand that when we freeze prices, we assume you can control real variables for the long run. Such things can happen. But I think it would, it's very important to give credibility to the paper message to show that this is actually somewhere in the data, right? I wouldn't use the threshold effect as an excuse to say, well, it's hard. But yeah, but that's what you have to show if you want to change the conventional view that these phenomena happen at different frequencies. And related to this, I was wondering if I'm a firm entertaining the possibility to make an investment, then, and there are these fixed costs that I must be forward looking. So, kind of the interest rate that matters to me is not the interest rate today, some present value of the interest rate I expect to pay. And so, even that would seem to dwarf you know, these jumps at our bar. Don't you worry about these things? Don't you think it would be really important to show that the phenomena are related, both in the data and in the theory? Um, yeah, no, uh, I agree with you. No? In reality, we expect a smoother relationship between changes in the interest rate and use of automation technologies. Um, we actually studied that case in the paper qualitatively, the results are the same. And you know, about what you say, I think it, the fact that the model has multiple steady state makes it interesting. Because you know, it tells us that uh, um, we don't need to have uh, monetary intervention having permanent impact uh, on uh, the interest rate uh, to have an effect on automation. In the sense that you, know, you can have, a ch if you are close to the tipping point, if you have even a reasonable change in the interest rate, that might bring you to a part of the economy when the automation progress becomes self-sustaining. That is when, uh, even if the interest rate is equal to the natural one, so we are, we become, uh, we follow the part of the economy under flexible prices, you know, the automation process becomes self-sustaining. So that a temporary monetary intervention might generate uh, a long-run impact uh, on the use of automation. And this also tells us that uh, the impact of uh, monetary policy intervention on the economy might be very state dependent. So a monetary policy intervention might have a different impact if you are far away from these tipping points or from this region where firms start changing their technology in response to a change in the interest rate, or if you're very close to it. So that's why we think that uh, having this multiple steady state is, uh, is interesting, because it tells you that even temporary intervention might trigger self-sustaining changes in automation. But I'm, I mean, I agree with you. Definitely, we need to think better about, uh, you know, we see this paper really as a first step at the question, as a way to organize thoughts. And, and to invite more empirical research. Peter? Thanks. So, so I, it's a fascinating um, presentation. I, 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 uh, let me ask, so, so you concentrated on monetary policy, but uh, it, it, it seems to me that uh, the question of capital versus labor taxation might, might also be Kind of influencing the, the, these these results, it might be that that uh, fiscal policy by 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 changing changing the relative uh, costs of, of capital versus labor could actually achieve this potentially much more persistently than, than monetary policy. And my question is, have, have you thought about this, and uh, and what do you think? And another question is 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 what if you have both low-skilled and high-skilled labor in, in your model. And it might be that, uh, that then low-skilled labor might not be able to, to uh, kind of work, work with more, uh, so for example, ICT. And, and then it might not be as clear that, uh, that one equilibrium is better in terms of the low-skilled labor. So it, it, they, they, might, they might prefer kind of a low, low automated equilibrium. So it, it might change some of your welfare conclusions. And, 
yeah, just one, one new thing. Yeah, I mean, about the, uh, your hinted fiscal policy, you, you're totally right. You know, there is a literature suggesting that uh, uh, fiscal policy might affect the cost of capital relative to the wage through changes in taxation, and that might have an impact on, uh, on the use of automation. And uh, you know, when we started, we want to think about that as well, but then we chose to fo focus the paper on, on monetary policy. But you're right that fiscal policy might have potentially bigger impact on uh, technological choices than uh, monetary policy. And uh, about the idea of looking at different, the impact on different skilled workers, it's super interesting, no? which goes back also to what Morten was saying before, no? that there are some interesting distributional implication. Again, when we started, we wanted to put them in, but then we thought, okay, there's too much stuff. No? Let's focus on a simple model in which we have just one type of workers, and, and perhaps as future step in the research agenda, we should also uh, incorporate these effects. And let me also mention that uh, you know, the welfare properties uh, of uh, these multiple steady states are not so clear. It's not clear that uh, you uh, might necessarily want to be in the high automation steady state. For instance, if the high automation steady state is associated with unemployment, then there is a trade-off. So depending on uh, uh, the way that you attach to labor productivity versus uh, employment, you might be in one or the other. We don't touch on this question with this paper, once again, because we thought that uh, just taking a positive perspective was you know, interesting enough to write a paper about it. But I think that there is a lot to say about welfare, too. That uh, you know, some, It's not clear that there is a good equilibrium and a bad equilibrium. It depends. It depends a lot. And once you introduce heterogeneity, this becomes even more true because then you introduce distributional issue between capitalists and workers and between different types of uh, workers. And these are you know, questions that we think would be very interesting to explore in the future. Michele. Thank you. Um, I have two, two questions. So the first one is, I suppose in, in your model, uh, there is a symmetric friction. The wages are rigid to the upside or to the downside. But you know, most of the time, we think uh, wages are most rigid to the downside. And what would happen if you take this downward wage rigidity? So my hunch is that uh, then when there is a monetary loosening, uh, labor becomes even more expensive than what you have now in your model. And then there would be more boost towards automation. And the second one is, have you thought about uh, you know, the narrative over the last 15 years? So we have had the very low interest rates uh, in Europe and in the US but no productivity boom. So what, what has uh, um, impeded to, to the mechanism that is in your model to act? Uh, because I would have expected, you know, if I well understood what uh, your point is, that we should have seen really a strong boost to productivity, which we didn't see in the data. Of course, many other things have happened, but did you think about it? Yeah, about your first point, that's very interesting because it hints at possible non-linearities. I think that if you were thinking about a case of uh, uh, downward wage rigidity, which I think empirically is very relevant, then the effect of uh, a monetary expansion would be very different than uh, a monetary contraction. So a monetary expansion would mainly have an impact on inflation, right? While a monetary contraction may potentially have uh, an impact on, uh, uh, on labor productivity and automation. Once again, here we started with the symmetric case, which is the simplest, but perhaps in reality the effects are asymmetric. So a monetary tightening might have very different impact than a monetary... Um, than a monetary loosening. And about you know, the correlation between interest rate and productivity, so here we are looking at a change in the interest rate, keeping everything as constant, right? In reality, there are many things uh, uh, affecting the economy. So you know, what the model will tell you is that uh, if we didn't have this drop in the interest rate, labor productivity would have been even lower. Let me mention, though, again, going back to the United Kingdom, which I think is an interesting case, there are some authors that have argued that uh, you know, the financial crisis brought about this increasing spread, this increase in the cost of capital for firms. You know, their fiscal policy was tightened. And they said you know, that in this environment, first choose to reduce investment and reduce the use of machines in production rather than firing workers. And so that triggered you know, the automation process of the economy. There is one, uh, one question on Slido. <laughs> so, let me read it out. Uh, what does the author think about firms taking into consideration the long run cost of using capital versus labor while substituting one for the other? Well, yeah, here, you know, first we react if uh, the cost of capital changes uh, in, the medium, uh, in the medium to long run. So here we're not thinking about, uh, you know, changing the interest rate taking place in a single quarter. We're thinking about more persistent intervention. But once again, you know, the fact that there are multiple steady states 
means that uh, um, you know monetary policy, even if it doesn't affect the interest rate for many years, may push the economy over a tipping point. After which, you know, this kind of process becomes uh, self-sustaining. But yeah, I mean, of course, uh, firms' automation decision will depend on medium-run interest rates. There are no more questions from the uh, floor. Then we we stop here. Thank you very much. Very nice session. Okay.